Well, to uh, convey the difference between thinking and reflecting. And I know I get questions all the time, what do you mean by reflection? And uh, Because when you think about reflecting, then you you try to figure it out and uh, you don't quite get it. Is it is it thinking about Dhamma or thinking about Four Noble Truths? Is it uh, analyzing? Uh, is it taking uh, the you know trying to reason it all out? And that's uh, that's the thinking process. Reflecting, uh, sati sampatanya is uh, is taking like the, the first noble truth of dukkha, suffering, and not trying to uh, think about suffering as some kind of you know the Holocaust and the racial problems and Islamic terrorism and unfairness uh, in the society and corruption and all that, but, or personal abuse. But the reality of suffering is that dukkha is, is brought in as a noble truth, first noble truth, and reflected on, is noticed, observed in terms of experience here and now. So it's not a matter of trying to uh, prove it or rationalize it or uh, understand it intellectually, but to recognize it. And so this is awakening, the sense of awakened attentiveness to the feeling of dissatisfaction, uh, worry, uh, self-consciousness, whatever, how, you know, this the more uh, kind of subtle forms of suffering, not to mention the, the, the greater ones. So this dukkha is, is to be understood, and this is the, the sequence in the first noble truth. The each noble truth has three aspects. <coughs> we chant in Tamajaka Sutta, and we talk about the, the three aspects of each noble truth. So there's three aspects and twelve insights all together, which is the, in the, the twelve insights is the completion. Uh, arahants are one, are the individuals who have the twelve insights. That's the conventional way of speaking. So, you know, to try to practice in order to become an arahant, you're missing the point. And uh, trying to complete the twelve insights so you can become this desired goal is you're not reflecting on desire, you're merely using a system in order to become something. And I hope you can see the difference. I can talk about dukkha and in terms of suffering in the world, about Africa and droughts and corruption and so forth and all the kind of injustices and misery. I can talk about all the suffering that comes from modern life here in England and the stress and so forth, as if it was, uh, you know, something out there, uh, something that was caused by <coughs> governments or intolerance or whatever. You know, they, well, you know, on the intellectual level, we, you know, we. Uh, we think about it and then we blame, we see the source of suffering as something caused from outside ourselves. What the Buddha is doing then is, <coughs> is not uh, blaming anybody or anything or any government or any system. Not a matter of, of uh, the source of suffering as being external, but reflecting on the experience uh, the suffering that one is experiencing here and now. Recognizing that it's this, it's, uh, this is dukkha, this sense of worry, of self-consciousness, of loneliness, of, of uh, jealousy and fear and, and uh, stress, 
sense of not being complete, of being discontented, dissatisfied. Just in a community like this, the, su the suffering is, you know, um, relating to others, our position, our, our one personality uh, conflicts with another. Oh, and we can't get what we want. We want something we can't get. Or we we blame the system, the tradition, uh, Theravada Buddhism. Uh, we blame the nuns or the monks or seniors, ajans, or or the ajans can blame the the uh, junior monks. <laughs> or whatever we can always find. Uh, you know, it's easy to go out and point to somebody or something, something external. And that's the thinking process. That's not reflecting on suffering. That's merely uh, trying to find the cause as if it was something external. What we're doing with, with, with this developing insight with these Four Noble Truths is recognizing the cause of suffering is not from external injustices or abuse or bullying or unfairness uh, from outside, but how we create the suffering. <coughs> my discontentment, my I wanting something to be s other than what it is. Wanting something I don't have. Wanting to attain, wanting to become an arahant, wanting to um, be respected or appreciated. I and mean, when I look at this, these kind of assumptions, wanting to be appreciated or respected, that very desire of me wanting to be appreciated. Now, reflecting on that. I'm not analyzing, thinking, uh, you know, putting it into some kind of personal flaw or personal fault, but recognizing the, this this uh, this longing or this this sense in myself that wants to be appreciated is like this. So I'm reflecting on the on the feeling of of this longing or expectation, noticing it. It's like this. Desire to be appreciated is like this. Fear of being humiliated or rejected is like this. So in the, the second noble truth, you have the, the um, causes and the origin of suffering. Now these... Uh, there's three kinds of desire, kama dana, pawadana, vipawadana. So desire or dana, Pali word dana, is we're not trying to get rid of it. We're not trying to become a desireless person. But because this realm that we're living in is a desire realm. This is the sense realm. We wouldn't be here if there was no desire. So desire is is uh, is part of the package that we get when we're born in this realm, sense realm. It's not trying to annihilate it. It is, is uh, an impossibility. But to recognize it. And so th what this is saying is that we're this awareness is a we're aware of desire. You can be observant, the knower of desire, rather than bec than become the person that has these desires or is trying to get rid of desire. As soon as you become the person, then you're you're caught in the trap again. You know, you're trying to get rid of desires, bad desires, greed, and and uh, anger, and all these dreadful things. Trying to get rid of them. Is an impossible task, you know. You, you'll never. You just. You're caught in the trap of samsara. So 
So to to be able to get out of the trap, you have to get out of the sangsara, and that's through awareness, through a paying attention, reflecting on this. And so these 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 four noble truths are uh, very skillful means. The Buddha g- gave us as a way of developing, of, of recognizing, realizing the Dhamma. So when we talk about the Dhamma, you can't, you know, it's not something you can find, something you are. So when you're aware, then that's the Dhamma, that's the reality of truth. When you're when there's awareness, when you're caught in in the f- delusions of desire, then you're back in the sangsara again. Be a personality that that has problems and tries to get something or get rid of something. So notice the the sequence of the three aspects. The the first statement. Isn't it? It's, it's a statement. It's an intellectual statement. It's saying there is dukkha, there is suffering. So that's, you know, that's that's the first insight. Is so certainly recognizing there is this suffering. You know, I do feel it. We start noticing. You're not looking outward anymore, but observing. Just the stress or anxiety, self-conscious, whatever uh, whatever words might describe this sense of lack, incompletion, of discontentedness, a uh, kind of anxiety, worry, haunt the human consciousness because of, of lack of understanding. So then the second insight into the first noble truth. And this is tells you what to do about it. So the first one, you've got this um, states the problem, what the what it is, uh, what to do about it, and the result of doing it. Now so you have this the what to do about Dukkha is to understand it. And then the result is understanding, recognizing, reflecting on the result of of uh, practicing in order to see, notice, observe, recognize, admit. So in to understand something, you have to accept it for what it is. You know, if you're just caught in resisting everything all the time, you know, trying to get rid of things, then you you never understand them. You merely react. So, so we're conditioned on a personal level to react to things. If it's bad or wrong or painful or unfair or whatever, we we just want to get rid of it. If it's unpleasant, uncomfortable, frightening, fearsome, and we we develop all kinds of habits of resisting, denying, rejecting. So, but in order to understand, you can't understand anything if you're constantly resisting it, fighting it, fearing it. So, so understanding is our ability to receive it. Suffering is like this. Stand under it. Accept the dukkha, admit it, notice it, feel it. Be the knower, be in the knowing that dukkha is. There is this this sense of anxiety or lack or discontentment, dissatisfaction with yourself or with whatever. Notice this, this sequence we call 
bariati bati 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 waiti in Pali. You know, this these three levels. One is uh, bariati like a statement. The the traditional statement of there is dukkha, there is suffering. Then then bati bati it means to practice to how to what to do with this dukkha is to you should understand it. So the second aspect of Eastern Old Truth is about what to do, how to practice. So it's always bati bati or bati ban. In Thai they use the word bati ban is meditation practice. So to understand suffering, you, if you keep analyzing and blaming it on external, you might come up with some clever theories and that, but you'll never, you'll never really understand it. You merely have more opinions and views that still reinforce the ego sense of a separate self. You might become an authority, you know, and and still. You know, still not really understand suffering. So notice this understanding, and it's an to understand then is opening, observing, noticing, and that's reflecting, and you know, observing that this this sense of incompleteness or discontentment. Anxiety. Those are, say, just the general kind of forms of dukkha before they become, you know, great tragedies or, you know, terrible fears uh, before we become really neurotic and uh, and uh, mad with our with our suffering. So the average, you know, the n- average person, human being, individual, is uh, the lives are filled with anxiety, worry, resentments. Life isn't always, you know, is, there's a lot of unfairness, injustice. We have to live in societies where, you know, that people don't treat us properly, and we don't. You know, we don't get what we should, and our parents aren't always uh, what they should be, and schools you know, like that. So we can, you know, make very good cases for you know why I suffer is because I was born into, you know, my parents were in arahants. The schools I went to, none of the teachers were enlightened masters. The rulers of the country weren't enlightened. It's all their fault. If they'd all been enlightened, then I wouldn't suffer, is the kind of spurious logic that comes from that way of thinking. But that's, uh, you know, to think like that is, is absurd, isn't it? Because that's, you know, that's you, you just decided to become the victim of life, blaming everyone else for your own unhappiness. <coughs> Where in this, this way, uh, you're not blaming anything, you're just observing. You're being the bhutto, or the awakened conscious aware awareness itself, and reflecting, noticing suffering, admitting it. Sometimes people just won't admit they suffer. They say, do you suffer? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm a happy person. I'm. And we, we want to think of ourselves as happy and, and in positive terms. But this is not to indulge in suffering or, or to make it into a problem, but to use, use dukkha the kind of clue to enlightenment that the Buddha gave is using this as a first noble truth. It's a clue, you know, it gives you a direction to not to look outward anymore, but start noticing how you really feel, what it's like to have a, a body. What is it like to have a human body in the present moment? 
to be sitting here and breathing, just observing, noticing the, the, that the body is, is a rather unpleasant experience most of the time. I mean, it binds us to the earth, doesn't it? You have to move it and feed it. It just gets thirsty, it gets tired. It, has to, it functions. You have to urinate, defecate. You have to do all these things throughout a lifetime. I'm trying to keep it clean and, and uh, healthy. You sit for very long, you begin to feel tensions and pain and restlessness. <coughs> so the body itself, not I'm not blaming the body, but noticing just the the this the that the body is like this. The human body. This body here is like this. It's a sensitive. Very sensitive form. And then it ages, it gets sickness, it has fevers, it gets diseases, gets hot or cold. So this is this is observing these these the, the realities of of have of this human body in, in the here and now. You have moments where it is pleasant enough, comfortable enough. But now one is looking at it not not in terms of trying to to always seek for comfort and and feeling you uh, know trying to feel good and feel healthy and feel you know uh, all right, but to recognize the the realities of of being born into this realm, being a human being, having a human body, having senses, having this eyes, ears, nose, tongue. The body itself, having a, a a mind, a retentive memory, having language and memory, and remembering things, both pleasant and unpleasant, pleasant memories, unpleasant memories, and this is. Uh, Getting in touch with being human, being a human being is like this. We're not trying to idolize humanity or disparage it, but recognize the reality of of, of this moment of of having this human body is like this. And so, this is reflecting on it. It's noticing and and understanding. Where when you when you make it personal and and then you you have an ideal of what you'd like the perfect human body uh, you know how we can we can imagine the perfect human form you know so that it's beautiful to look at healthy well proportioned beautiful complexion vigorous energies. Lovely hair, fingernails, beautiful nails, and long tapered fingers, lovely small feet, beautifully formed arches. The perfect, I can, I can imagine the perfect human body. Now th that's, uh, th uh, you know, and then it doesn't get old either. You don't think of it as, as an old body, do you? Perfect human body is always, you know, young looking and beautiful. <coughs> but the but the body having a having a body now is like this. It's not comparing it with an ideal or wishing it were otherwise, but noticing. And if I am aware of how how it, you know I don't like my body or I d wish it were otherwise I want it to look different or I uh, I don't want it to get old or things like that can be aware 
of this, I'm creating this desire for it to be something else. So this is what we call reflecting on the way it is. Now the second noble truth then is the, uh, you know, w observing uh, what desire is as experience. So that's why, you know, when uh, yesterday morning when I was talking about practicing in order to get some desired goal you imagine, you know, like sitting here on this retreat practicing in order to get samadhi in the future or to attain arahantship or to become enlightened or whatever this is uh, this is uh, desire for becoming isn't it bawadanha i'm practicing meditation with as bawadanha as my means i don't see what i don't understand bawadanha i just operate from that position i'm starting with bawadanha so when I sit in meditation, you know, I'm doing it in order to get something from it, some desired goal, some maybe ideal state like nibbana, expect or long or desire for becoming something. Now notice how much of, you know, monastic life can be motivated by pavadanha, wanting to become. Now, to reflect on wanting to become, isn't it? It's like this. this it's, I feel it, there's a, a sense of compulsiveness, a sense of uh, I, I'm not good enough the way I am. I've got to become something else. I'm not content. I'm not, I don't appreciate what <coughs> the way it is. I'm not content. I'm really, uh, I, can, I can always imagine it being better. I can always imagine myself as being better than what I am. So I practice in order to become a better person. It's still bhavadanha, wanting to become. Or vipavadanha, the feeling of trying to get rid of things. Aversion, wanting to get rid of anger or greed or jealousy or trying to get rid of stress and fi trying to get rid of fear vipavadanha so what is that like when you reflect on it you know you can see you know in my own experience so much of my early practice was trying to get rid of things there's a controlling and we, the control feet freak problem, where we we're trying to get rid of the bad stuff, get rid of the defilements, get rid of the kilesas, get rid of the negative states, get rid of the asavas, and get rid of the nivaranas. <laughs> that seems right, you know, logically. That's the, you know, that's how the mind is, you know. You you try to hold on to the good and get rid of the bad. <coughs> but in reflecting on the the second noble truth, you see the whippa vadanha, this this resistance, denial, rejection, uh, fighting against, uh, suppressing tendencies and habits that we have. So, you know, you understand the words, but the reality of it, notice in your, in your consciousness these tendencies to suppress or deny or reject or resist. Rather than becoming someone that doesn't have any desires, you become, you're, you're becoming or you are training yourself to 
recognize, be the expert, desires like this, tanha is like this. Kama dhanha, sensual, the, being a, you know, the sensual uh, desire that arises through the senses, through seeing and, and forming, you know, desire for some beautiful object or sound or smell, taste or touch. So you got gamma dhanha, bhava dhanha, vipava dhanha. And then this should be let go of. So you have this sense of letting go, putting down, recognizing them. So in the very act, the very reality of recognition, you you and allowing them to be, you let go of them. In, in so in dukkha, you know, suffering, if you, once you understand it, meaning you're allowing it to be what it is, you're, you're seeing it in this way of Dhamma. It is what it is. Then you, you then you, you, this, you begin to notice the attachment, the clinging, the, the identity. The obsessiveness uh, around th- these desires, and when you when you recognize that that attachment, clinging, and obsessiveness, obsessive, compulsive uh, fears and re- reactions to life are unnecessary. You can let go. It doesn't mean you doesn't. It's not an act of annihilation. It's not mipawadanha. It's an insight of Relaxing, letting go of things, letting things be what they are, allowing vipavadana to be it, to be that, or bhavadana or gamadana. But you're being the knowing of it. You're you're recognizing it, knowing it. It is the way it is. So in my own experience, for example, the exploring these three kinds of desire, I would, rather than just try to get rid of desire, I began to study, observe it, uh, reflect upon it. This resistance, this rejection of things is like this. Again, to just notice the feeling, the kind of uh, mental state that's created through resisting life, through rejecting, through compulsive need to control things, is like this. Or bhavadanha, this ambition, trying to want to become, attain, change stream entry, wanting to become a good meditator, become a good monk. I mean, bhavadana doesn't mean you, you know, it isn't a kind of, doesn't need to be megalomania. It's just, it can be very reasonable desires to become better person, nicer person. So... (laughs) So it's not the dunha isn't isn't something uh, you know always uh, negative. It can be quite positive. Wanting to become a, an arahant is certainly a noble goal. You know, it's, it's inspiring. Wanting to become a a good monk, a good nun is 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 you know is a good thing. It's Noble desire. So uh, we're not just we're not putting down desire, but recognizing it, studying it, learning from it, because desire is a condition that arises and ceases. It's not one's true nature. You, the ability to reflect and observe desire is not desire. Mindfulness is not a desire. Satisambhajanya is not. A Dunha.
So, because desire is a mental object, it's it's observable. All these three kinds of desire can be observed in the here and now. So they're like mental objects. They're the objects that one I- that 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 there's awareness of you reflect on desires like this, dunha is like this. And then the insight, letting go, means to put down, or release your grip on it, relax, in other words. Don't, not a matter of getting rid, but letting go of it, that tight grip, that obsessive identity. Is is you you know you you're releasing yourself from that, putting it down, letting it go. So it's not a an annihilating act at all. You're letting whatever it is, you know, if it's bhava dana, vipava dana, or gama dana, you're letting it be what it is. You're not trying to make it or get rid of it, but recognize it, reflect on it. Then the insight of letting go. And then the third aspect, but he wait, but he wait, he is the Pali word. The result of letting go is like this. And so you're only, you're this, this awareness observing attachment, non attachment, desire, non desire. Now, uh, as you're as your confidence in awareness increases, then you you're aware of non-desire, desirelessness is like this. And so there's an awareness of desire, attachment to desire, and desirelessness. Now this is reflecting on the realities of of this rather than. <coughs> Uh, intellectualizing Buddhism. And the third noble truth is uh, the cessation. Now this is uh, when you accept something and let it go, uh, it's like accepting doesn't, you know, in this way is not Clinging, clinging, uh, or ubadana is always done out of ignorance. It's a habit, a conditioning of the mind. You know the way we condition to hold on, or reject, resist, deny. So ubadana, or clinging, or attachment, or identity, is, uh, you know, is a is a habit pattern out of ignorance that that we all have developed. So the third noble truth, uh, letting go, of having let go of desire, you you can allow it to be what it is. So there is an awareness of its cessation. Desire is not permanent. It can't sustain itself. It's a condition that arises and ceases. Now, if you're resisting all the time, you never notice the cessation of anything, the absence. You're merely caught in the desire for becoming. You know, that's what modern materialism does. It's always There's always something better, something newer, something improved, up to date, the latest, the best. You know, the whole system we live under is based on creating desire, gamadana, bhavadana. With a wadanha, the whole thing is, is uh, you know, is based on this ignorance. So we live in a society that is ignorant of the Dhamma. So through this reflectiveness, this sati sampatanya, then you observe and letting go. Then you're 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 with 
with uh, mindfulness, it's self-sustaining. You know, it does. You don't create mindfulness. It's not a, a concentrated state that you that depends on on conditions supporting it. It's recognizing it. It's it's not something that uh, that I can claim as some kind of personal, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that uh, some kind of personal quality that I have. Mindfulness is is, is a natural state. It's it's uh, self-sustaining. You don't have to cling to it. It's not something you cling to. You can't. As soon as you think you're clinging to mindfulness, you you're not mindful. So mindfulness then is the is the way that the Buddha emphasized as, as the gate to the deathless or the 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 crack in the facade, the the way to get out of the sangsara, the escape hatch from suffering is a mindfulness or awareness. So when they, with this awareness then, we actually notice, observe the cessation of desire. Desire can't sustain itself if you don't, if you don't keep feeding it and identifying and resisting or, or following. It arises and ceases. When desire is, when desire ceases, there's still consciousness. Awareness, because we don't create consciousness or awareness. It's not out of ignorance. These are these are not my creations out of ignorance of the Dhamma. This is the Dhamma itself. So consciousness and awareness, sampatanya, you know, the it's intelligence. It's universal intelligence. It's not personal knowledge about Buddhism. And therefore the cessation is recognized, realized. Now that realization then is uh, the, the third noble truth is there is the cessation of suffering. And then the, the bhati-bhata, the practice, is the, the recommended practice uh, practice is to realize, recognize, this is reality. Dhamma is real. Recog it's, you recognize it. It's this. This is the Dhamma. It's reality. It's not a thing that you can, that you can, um, that is a mental object. You know, it's not something that this is dumb, and then, and then you see, it and then it's gone. But as you uh, reflect, have these insights, then your sense of this this reality is is apparent. It's here and now. So then, the realizing. Recognize this should be realized. This is reality. So this reality then is is the path, isn't it? The eightfold path <coughs> is this is what they call stream entry or sotapanna, where you you recognize this and and then there's right understanding, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. <coughs> that makes it sound very complicated, but it it's merely uh, the bhavana or the cultivation of mindfulness. Learning to trust it, recognizing it, realizing emptiness or non-attachment. So when desire ceases, when you when you recognize the cessation 
of desire. There's still the body's still here, hasn't disappeared. Uh, still, there's still consciousness operating, mindfulness. But there's non-attachment. There's non-self. Non-suffering. Non-desire is like this. So you the discerning desire and non desire. Discerning self and non self. This discerning is uh, the panya uh ability that we have. It's universally universal intelligence, in other words. We're opening our to universal intelligence rather than acquired knowledge that we get through modern education. So as you can see, this is this is you have to realize this for yourself. Uh, nobody can can do it for you. It's not a magic wand that that somebody can tap you on the head and you're enlightened. It's it's uh, you know it's up to you what you do with this or don't do with it. You know that's your business. But the uh, encouragement, you know, the encouragement to use this. Uh, is teaching because it is a very skillful teaching to have de using the kind of ordinary banal experience of suffering as the kind of key to the door isn't it it's taking something or not special not high and sublime and marvelous it's taking something generally we don't like anyway we don't want we fight against it. Nobody wants to suffer. We want we don't we try to resist it, find happiness, look for happiness, comfort, pleasure, excitement. Look for meaning and purpose and so forth. So our lives are, you know, caught in this this uh, sangsaric trap, this vortex that one is kind of whirled around with in life. If you don't, you know, if you don't awaken to it. So out transcending the vortex is with a simple imminent ability to awaken and be aware. So that the deathless Nibbana, desirelessness, non-suffering, is reality. These are not just abstract ideals, some kind of metaphysical speculation that you find out, you know, after you die, whether you, you were right or wrong. <laughs> it's like touching earth, bringing yourself back, see the real. Reality is here and now. So it's, uh, and to recognize this, it's, uh, this is within, within the, <coughs> the uh, this human form, you know, within the restrictions of being this individual, this person, this body, uh, this moment, we have this opportunity. Now when we, when we are not in reality, then we're caught into this vortex, the samsara. We're whirled around with our fears and desires and compulsions, obsessions, kind of helpless victims of the conditioning process. Because, you know, we were conditioned through ignorance. 
my personality and that was is a is a personality that was conditioned out of ignorance not understanding the Four Noble Truths. There are three aspects and twelve insights. <coughs> so the personality that one has cannot be trusted. I do not trust my own personality even after forty years as a monk. Your personality is never going to get enlightened. So it's not trying to improve your personality to become a better and nicer person but to awaken and w recognize, realize ultimate reality. So in, uh, you know, in terms of living here in a community, you, know, you can see my personality manifests itself and maybe you you like some of my parts of my personality, you don't like others. <laughs> uh, personalities are like that, isn't it? To have a completely likable, saintly personality. You know. I'm not conditioned to be a saint. I was born in the United States. You're conditioned to be greedy, self centered. What about me, me and mine, my rights and what I think and self-assertion and I'm the important one. That's my personality is uh, you know, conditioned through, through those values and goals and, and cultural attitudes. So, so that I'm not complaining about it, but I recognize that. Recognize the the personality, but I don't believe in it anymore. Where before I had the insight into this, I, I fully believed that I was my personality. There is no separation. I'm, I am this person, this person, I'm this way, I'm this body, I'm this kind, I'm this type, I'm like this, my experience, my emotional habits, my desires, my aspirations, etc. Believed uh, and never questioned it. So then, in in vipassana meditation, you're actually, you know, looking at the person now, not not judging it, not trying to to even change it, but recognize it as a mental object, zakya ditti. Sakya Ditti is the first fetter. The, and these fetters then are the the uh, the ten fetters. These these are the, the this list of ten fetters is very useful because it's a kind of check off list <coughs> to 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 recognize what you know that put this this word Sakya Ditti into your into your Mind, well, we, c we can say call it defined as the ego or the personality view or whatever in English. But it's a conditioned personality. You know, the uh, sense of myself and its identity with the body, with uh, my memories and my habits, my obsessions, so forth. Uh, personality is like this, Sakya Ditti. So this awareness of the personality is not personal. Now, notice the difference, to discern the difference between anatta and atta. Atta is like self, sense of self. It's uh, sakya ditti. So you, you kind of, you, you can observe sakya ditti. Be aware of Sakya Ditti, not judge it. Not, you know, so Sakya Ditti, even wh however it manifests, whether it's clever or stupid or right or wrong or good or bad or mean and nasty or saintly and or refined or coarse, 
is not the issue, is it? It's it's recognizing this 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 habit of seeing myself, creating myself as a person by identifying with the condition. So recognize that sakaditi then is is an, is another clue in deliberation to be able to observe, be the knower of sakaditi rather than be the sakaditi. Self-view. So just ask yourself, you know, you know, be don't be afraid of your personality, but be observe it. How I react, I, you know, how I react to things when the sun is out, when the, when it gets cold and wet, when uh, I get praised and admired and when I'm criticized and when I'm irritated, when I'm frightened, when I feel threatened by things, when I feel grumpy and mean-hearted, when I feel generous and ebullient. You know, there's an awareness of this. And it's not, ta you know, where before, on a personal level, I was very critical uh, you know, I don't want to be a mean and nasty, bad person. So even though I have these kind of feelings sometimes, feeling mean, nasty, and selfish, and bad, I would then start judging. I shouldn't feel like this. I shouldn't think these kind of thoughts. I'm a bad person because uh, this, uh, these bad thoughts, this mean-heartedness, and so it become neurotic, you know, because co so complicated personalities. Because you, then you're you're always taking sides. You want you want to be the good person, but then you've got all these other reactions: anger, resentment, jealousy, fear, irritation, stinginess, self-centeredness. And you don't like, I don't like them, personally. Don't want to be a selfish, mean-hearted person. But in terms of reflecting, then, it's being selfish and mean-hearted. Being aware of this is a condition. You know, so it's not a matter of, of refining the personality, but recognizing it, seeing it as, as an object, knowing it as uh, a sankara as a con impermanent condition of rising, ceasing, rather than some kind of of uh, permanent uh, fault, some kind of defect in my character that that wipes me out uh, as a decent kind of person because you know I do I have these fears and and anxieties and and selfish desires and so forth and. And so they're with me all the time. But in terms of the reality, is they come and go, isn't it? Your personality changes according to the condition. So be the knower. Being the knower of this personality is not a critic, not taking sides, not trying to make yourself into a saintly person, but recognizing personality, sakyaditi, is like this, the sense of myself. And so non-self is like this. Non-self is pure awareness. With awareness, there's no self. So this is a fact. This is reality. No self is a reality. It's real. It's not uh, a kind of playing a game with my mind, it's reality. Because uh, as you recognize and trust awareness, you know, I don't create it. It's not nothing to do with being Ajahn Sumedho or some somebody or anything at all, is it? It's this is this is non self, this awareness.
And so it's 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 a fact. It's real. And it and when I recognize this and trust it, then I don't create the suffering into the conscious experience of this form. So there is a there is a way out. There is this this escape hatch. There is this opportunity that we all have to be free, to be liberated from these delusions. 